Okay, so uh, thanks very much for the invitation to speak and to uh, debate a, a good colleague and friend. So I'm going to argue uh, for the management of squamous cell cancer of the esophagus that we should consider surgery after chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, I think we have to look a little bit more into the details of some of the, the studies that, uh, that uh, Dr. Lordick presented. Oops, it's not moving. Sorry, oops. So even though we debate these issues of chemotherapy, chemoradiation, the role of surgery, the, the benefits of current neoadjuvant strategies are still quite marginal. Survival with surgery alone uh, generally is less than 20 to 40 percent. The two approaches that uh, are applied globally are uh, preoperative chemotherapy, which is mostly done in Japan, or a combination of chemotherapy and radiation with or without surgery, which is the most common Western practice. But again, survival uh, improvements over surgery alone are marginal and range between 6 to 12 percent in older studies. But to me, the debate should end right here. Uh, if we look at the survival results for the CROSS trial for squamous cancer, the median overall survival was 81.6 months versus 21.1 months for surgery. So, so uh, Florian, I think we, we lose the debate if we just look at those numbers. And uh, uh, arguably, we have to select patients appropriately for surgery, but this is quite a striking difference in survival. Why should we operate on patients after chemotherapy and radiation? Obviously, to improve survival. And these are tumors that have high rates of local persistence or recurrence with chemotherapy and radiation alone. And unlike adenocarcinomas, which are more distal and more amenable to surgical salvage, these patients can have catastrophic local failures with fistulization into the airway and other complications. So chemotherapy alone, at least in the West, is a failed approach for squamous cancers. Uh, the U.S. intergroup trial uh, studied 450 patients with preoperative and postoperative 5-FU platinum and showed no impact on survival, very poor rates of curative resection, and no benefit for squamous cancers. The larger MRC-OEO2 trial in 800 patients at long-term follow-up reported only a 6% survival benefit for preoperative chemotherapy, but this was only attributed to improving the rates of R0 resection and maybe a little bit better survival benefit for squamous cancers. Preoperative chemotherapy alone is one of the Japanese standards of care, but the Japanese trials of platinum 5-FU, in my assessment, uh, are quite problematic. Uh, the postoperative chemotherapy trial from Japan, JCOG 9210, uh, showed a disease-free survival benefit for adjuvant chemotherapy, but no overall survival benefit. And the, the actual benefit for adjuvant chemotherapy was only seen in node-positive patients. The subsequent study, which established the Japanese standard of care, was JCOG 9907, which showed that preoperative chemotherapy was better than postoperative chemotherapy. However, the results from this trial are really contrast and almost conflict with the previous study. In this study, there was no disease-free survival benefit and no benefit for N1 patients. Overall survival benefit was only seen in N0 patients and overall there was a 12% five-year survival benefit. And another complicating uh, feature for this study is only 65% of the postoperative patients got chemotherapy compared to all patients that received preoperative treatment. So the role of preoperative chemotherapy to me is, is just not uh, clearly established. So non-operative chemoradiation was established by the American RTOG trial 8501. This was a trial largely in squamous cancers which compared a higher dose of radiation therapy alone with or without two cycles of 5-FU and cisplatinum. And this trial really changed the standard of care. It showed that a combination of chemotherapy and radiation was curative. Uh, we achieved about a 25% long-term survival. There were no survivors with radiation alone. However, 50% of patients had local persistence or recurrence of cancer arguing for a role for surgery in these patients. So what about randomized trials? Uh, uh, the, uh, Florian mentioned the uh, German randomized trial uh, only in squamous cancers. This randomized uh, 170 patients to chemotherapy and uh, radiation uh, followed by surgery versus chemoradiation alone. Uh, 
And this showed no difference in median survival. Uh, there was a trend towards overall survival improvement and a significant improvement in local control of more than 23% favoring the surgical arm. Now, Florian showed these slides earlier, but uh, anytime you can put a finger between survival curves, that to me is a positive study. So arguably, this was an underpowered trial because we see a, a, a survival benefit for the surgery arm uh, uh, at late follow-up and significant improvement in local control compared to uh, 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 chemoradiation alone. Now, I think we argue, uh, given the potential mortality of surgery, we have to select our surgical patients carefully. Not all patients are a candidate for surgery with squamous cancers, and we need to uh, minimize the operative risk in these patients. So then we have the larger French trial, chemoradiation alone or chemoradiation followed by surgery. Now, in the French study, you had to respond to chemoradiation to be randomized. So this trial selected out responding patients. So it's a different question. They didn't randomize all patients. They entered 450 patients, and only 260 responders were randomized. The non-responding patients were excluded. And if we compare chemoradiation plus surgery versus chemoradiation alone, here there was no difference in median or overall survival, and this 9% improvement in local control did not um, uh, translate into a survival benefit. And here we see that in responding patients, there appears to be less of an impact on surgery other than local control compared to chemoradiation alone. Now then these authors published what happened to the non-randomized patients, the patients that weren't randomized and taken off study. 192 patients were not randomized, and 112 of these actually went to surgery, so about 60%. And R0 resections were achieved in 71%, so about 40% of the non-responder patients and non-randomized patients went to surgery. And they had a median survival of 17 months if they were resected. And even in uh, the non-responders, 18 patients had a near pathologic complete response, uh, and this accounted for about 16% of all these resected salvage patients. And their median survival in the responders that had good pathologic response was not reached. And indeed, the median overall survival of these resected non-responder patients was the same as the survival of patients undergoing upfront surgery. So arguably, in the non-responding patients, surgery plays a role and can uh, contribute to a curative outcome. So the problem is, how do we identify who is a responder or a complete responder? The predictive accuracy of post-chemoradiation endoscopy is limited. This is a series from Memorial. We looked at 137 patients undergoing biopsy after chemoradiation. 76% had a negative biopsy post therapy, but only 35% of these patients had a pathologic CR. So uh, endoscopy is not that useful, although a negative biopsy was a better predictor for squamous cancers than adenocarcinomas. Another tool to guide us potentially is PET scan and pathologic complete response. This is another series from Memorial, nearly 500 patients treated with chemoradiation and a PET scan done after chemoradiation. In all comers, PET response was not associated with either pathologic complete response or nodal disease. However, in squamous cancers, if you had a very high SUV response, this correlated with path CR. Indeed, if your SUV reduction was greater than 75%, you had an 85% chance of a path CR. So perhaps a combination of a negative endoscopy and biopsy, good resolution on PET scan may guide us in selecting patients for non-operative management. But then we have the CROSS trial. Uh, this is a contemporary study Paclitaxel, carboplatinum, uh, a well-tolerated, uh, easy-to-administer regimen, and I would argue with Florian, who still advocates that we torture patients with 5 effusus platinum and radiation, this regimen should really replace that regimen. Uh, this is much better tolerated, easier to administer, and uh, this uh, trial was positive on multiple counts. Uh, R0 resection rates were improved from 69 to 92 percent. And if we look at the survival, uh, looking at the bottom here, the biggest split was in the squamous cancers. For squamous cancers, again, a median overall survival of 81.6 months versus 20 mon 21 months for surgery alone, and a substantial improvement in progression-free survival, 74 months versus 11 months. And local tumor progression was also reduced substantially. Uh, 
And to me, a pathologic CR rate of 50%, I mean, how much more data do you need, Florian, not to endorse this regimen for patients with squamous cancers? What, what's the good evidence for 5-FU platinum with a path CR rate of 25%? So this should be the regimen both in the, the preoperative setting and the definitive setting to give to patients. So uh, to summarize then, uh, in esophageal squamous cancer, chemotherapy and radiation plus surgery is favored. This achieves the highest overall survival and significant reductions in local recurrence. I would argue that all patients should be at least considered for surgery, but obviously this needs to be an individual decision. Certainly the data argue that surgery salvages non-responding patients, but patients with a good response to chemoradiation, we can individualize the role of surgery versus observation, and obviously only medically fit patients should be sent to surgery. And we clearly need better means to identify residual disease, and we hope that technologies like circulating tumor DNA, diffusion-weighted MRI, and other approaches will give us more answers. Thanks very much.